marici ade mari marici apa mari kita berdendang si pinang muda mari kai bahagiamu telah kuruntuhkan darah bukan gadis At the height of his career in the 50s and 60s, P. Ramley was hailed as Asia's Charlie Chaplin. Ia bukan insan seni penyulap harta negara. Ia bekalkan pusaka lebih berharga, bermaruah bagi bangsanya. Kostumia P. Ramley is only my father. Tapi he belongs to everybody. Itu saja saya punya pegangan. He acted in 66 films, directed 35, and wrote 33 of them, as well as having composed over 360 songs in his lifetime. Bi Ramli ni film cinta saya laku. Jangan sekarang tu tahu mau beli laku. Conquering every medium of the entertainment spectrum, P. Ramley had an infinite charm, laced with a healthy dose of humor, warmth, and humility that endeared him to many. But his phenomenal rise from stagehand to screen sensation had ill-prepared him for the downward spiral to rejection and obscurity. It's a day because they return to Bali, they my own country, they thought people that appreciate it. After death, his popularity soared to incredible heights. On the 29th of May, 1973, legendary Malaysian screen icon P. Ramli dies, broke and broken. Apa salah dia? Itu kataan yang cakap dia cakap. Dia tanya saya, adakah people will remember me? Uh, kan? Saya tak boleh faham jiwa dia. Saya tak boleh buat apa waktu itu. His sudden death at age 44 is greeted with disbelief and shock around Malaysia and throws the country into sadness and confusion. Banyak orang nangis. India, Putu Mayang, Kacang Putih, Cina Jual Sayur. Saya tanya, kenapa lu nangis sampai ini macam? Ini orang banyak baiklah, dia banyak tolong saya. Kenapa dia mati, kenapa Tuhan Allah ambil sama dia? Within hours, glowing tributes start to swamp the media. Tidak ada di Asia dan saya rasa tidak ada di dunia pun ya, yang saya kenal dalam uh, uh, dunia perfilman. Tidak ada tokoh seperti Piramli ini. But unwanted and unloved by his own people in the years up to his death, guilt begins to prick a nation's collective conscience. Wah ini lah dia gambar yang dia nak sunting. His films and songs had grossed millions of dollars and swept more than 30 awards Asia-wide. Ini kebiasaan lah ya. Masa seseorang tu masih hidup memang tidak dipedulikan. Memang apa tu? Apabila dia meninggal, bau kita tahu, bau kita sedar bahawa apa yang dia buat tu. Meninggalkan sesuatu harazana yang suka untuk kita menidakkan. Mengapakah kau diciptakan Allah menjadi manusia? With regret coming in large doses, there is a clamor for his songs and movies and frenzied calls to have him properly honored and remembered. Memorials, roads and buildings are named in his honor, and P. Ramli is posthumously awarded the Malaysian honorific title Tan Sri, a knighthood in stature. But for a growing number of voices within the entertainment community, it is too little, too late. 
Mungkin kalau dia masih hidup Dia dapat tan seri ni Saya bangga lah saya kata Tapi sekarang saya tak rasa apa lah Cuma saya rasa sedih Sesudahnya dia pergi Baru diagung-agungkan Masa dia hidup Tak ada orang pedulikan dia It's sad but it's true If you want to be loved, you want to be famous, you have to die first. Revered as the greatest Malaysian entertainer of the last century, P. Ramli got his big break at the Shaw Studios on Jalan Ampas in Singapore in the 1940s. Known around Asia as the Warner Brothers of Malaysia, it was here that P. Ramli started working as a stagehand. Within a few years, P. Rumley was Shaw Studios' most successful movie maker, writing, directing, and starring in a series of box office hits. Ketika itu, P. Rumley punya nama betul-betul tengah. Menjulang tinggi. Orang datang cari dia tu tak berhenti-berhenti. Sampai saya bilang, Ram, tahun ini bukan lu cari duit. Duit datang cari dia. At the height of his career, P. Ramli was not only an idol of the entertainment scenes in Malaysia, but had a huge following overseas, most notably Singapore and Indonesia. He was also a popular figure amongst the Japanese film fraternity. And in a period where Hindi movies ruled the Malaysian box office, Ramli's films rocked the status quo for the first time in decades. Dia memang selalu dia nak meninggikan mutu kesenian bangsa kita lah. Dia selalu, umpamanya kalau nak buat filem pun dia selalu nak bikin filem yang bercorak macam kemelayuan ya. Ha, kalau pun lagu pun gitu. The man whose films, music and charisma inspired and touched the hearts of millions seemed untouchable. But Ramli was more than just an actor. He was a man of vision. Knowing that color films were the way forward, making his first screen movie in color became an obsession for the next couple of years. Jadi orangnya Edwan tahu eh, macam sepuluh dua puluh tahun dia beli tahu. In 1965, after completing his last successful film for the Shaw Studio Singapore, Ramli left to join Madeka Film Studio in Kuala Lumpur. For the next seven years, Rumley made 18 films with Madeka Studio, none of which had the box office success of his earlier films. Recording companies which had profited so much from his sweat and tears turned their backs on him. Rumley hanya ada kontrak di Singapura. Jadi saya pergi tanya Mr. Sbe untuk kontrak baru lah. Mr. Sbe, eh tak boleh. But even worse, his efforts to recapture his former glory were often ridiculed and vilified by the public and media. Memang, memang pada masa itu memang piramid itu buat kena. Apabila dia buat enam jahanam, lagi itu buat dia kena. Petelagahan piramid itu ada kan? Dengan wartawan, wartawan selalu kritik dia kan? P. Ramli's triumph and fame had once earned him an iconic status. In his final years, he tried desperately but failed to recapture his former glory. But in death, he became a timeless superstar. Born Tuku Zakaria Nyakpute in Penang Island on the 22nd of March 1929, P. Ramli rose from humble beginnings. His father, Tuku Nyakpute, was an Indonesian sailor from Aceh who migrated to Malaya. He settled in Penang when he married Che Ma Hussein, Ramli's mother. The letter P in P. Ramli stands for Pute, his father's name. He used this name in a singing competition when he was 17 years old and emerged champion. Believing it brought him luck, he decided to keep it. Educated in Penang, P. Ramli went to school as a teenager at the Penang Free School. Saya kawan dengan yang kenal dengan dia masa dia satu sekolah lagi, tapi sekolah lain dia sekolah Melayu Kampung Jawa. Saya sekolah Melayu Perak Road. 
His faithful friend Sukadi remembers going everywhere with the irrepressible Ramli. Lalu di Penang selalu kami berdua ronda sana ronda sini. Basikal dia satu saja basikal, saya tak nak basikal. Naik dua. A cheeky daredevil teen, Ramli was always up to mischief wherever he went. Jadi apa yang ada pokok jambu, pokok kedondong ke pokok apa kalau Ramli sampai saja tinggal tahu. Putih-putih semua dia angkat. Ha. Ramli main nakai masa kecil-kecil. Kami punya di rumah mak cik saya tu meja panjang ni. Dia balik sekolah dia boleh stand tu. Dia pernah sini sampai hujung ni. Mak saya kata ram yang apa lah nak pergi jahanam ke tak ada apa. Dia turun dia stand lagi. Cukup tiga kali stand cukup. Ha. Arwah punya hal. Saya sayang sumber dekat dia. Composer and musician Datuk Ahmad Nawab, who went to school with Ramli, recalls seeing him in a scuffle. Saya same school dengan dia, Francis Light School. Saya panggil dia budak keroncong. Saya selalu main bola saya tu. Saya tengok dia, ada, ada orang duduk bergaduh. Lah. Bergaduh, saya pun pergi tengok ramai orang keliling lah. Macam tengok boxing lah. Saya tengok Firamli ni bergaduh dengan satu, 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 orang, satu orang Cina. Tengok bertumbuk lah. Kalau tengok muka dia, ada kena pisau kat sini. Ada bekas pisau di muka dia. Ha, parut dia. Tapi bila dia dah gemuk kan, dah tak apa nampak lah. Waktu dia kurus tu dia nampak. But the wayward teenager's destiny was changed by a simple twist of fate. Ramli was about 14 when the Japanese invaded and occupied Malaya from 1941 to 1945 during the Second World War. The Japanese left free movie tickets at post offices in the town centers to entice Malayan youths into their naval camps. It wasn't long before Ramli and Sukadi got hold of those tickets. To their disappointment, it was a Japanese propaganda movie. But that wasn't the only surprise in store for the mischievous teens. At the end of the movie, they were forced into a waiting truck and ended up as instant recruits of a Japanese naval college. It was this stint at the college that taught P. Ramli to speak fluent Japanese, play the violin, and later influence his disciplined work style. Malam-malam bila seminggu dua kali mesti rai atau mengajar lah. Lepas graduate, saya pergi bagian Jepun punya signal. Signal bendera lah. Dia, dia pasal pada drone, dia masuk bagian torpedo. Even while Japanese soldiers were committing atrocities outside their college walls, the two teenagers formed an attachment to the Japanese officers in the college who were good to them. Dengan di luar-luar saja lah, Jepun yang kejap tu, macam sekolah kami tak ada. Jepun serendah dengar semasa dalam training, uh, malam lah kami dengar. Uh, dengar radio, jadi kami masuk store, Semua pedang-pedang Jepun saya dengan Ramli ambil. Semua ni. Takut, takut semua ni lah. Takut dia orang Jepun nara kiri. Three years after the end of the Second World War, P. Ramli and Sukadi were spotted performing at an agricultural fair in Penang by B.S. Rajans, a director with the Shaw Studio. He invited both of them to audition as musicians at the studio and left them two train tickets to Singapore. The two friends, who had never been out of Penang, decided to accept the invitation and try their hand at show business. They set off for Singapore on the morning of the Eid Muslim festival that marks the end of the fasting month. P. Ramli remembered the excitement of celebrating Eid on a train for the first time. I still remember, on the 8 August 1948, Hari yang mula-mula saya keluar dari Pulau Pinang menuju ke Singapura untuk bermain film adalah hari raya yang pertama. Dan pada hari itu saya merayakan hari raya yang itu seperti di, di dalam kereta api. Jadi saya dapat melihat banyak negara, banyak negeri berhari raya dari Pulau Pinang terus ke Singapura. Dulu kereta api pun tak kata tahu bahasa asap ni, pakai arang ni. Muka ada hitam-hitam, cuci muka. Dia bagi take kelas. Jadi kami turun-turun. 
Cuci-cuci muka semua barulah makan. But with little money, the two young hopefuls were living on excitement and adrenaline, not luxuries, as Sukadi vividly remembers about their accommodation. A week after their auditions, Sukadi, who was unsuccessful, returned home to Penang. But Ramli, who was still hopeful of an acting offer, settled for odd jobs as clapperboy, stagehand, and later as playback singer. Ramli's patience finally paid off when, at age 19, he was given his first screen debut in a supporting role as the villain in the film Chinta. Former actor and crooner, the late Datuk Ahmad Daud, recalled watching the film with friends in Penang. Bila dia buka baju dalam gambar cerita, kita ni member bergelap. Kenapa? Bila dia angkat tangan tu, dia ni terlang tang 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 tulang, tulang kering punya kuih. Adanya dia punya apa pipi tu, apa orang panggil macam tonjol ke depan tu, jawab batu, kuih. Bahkan bila dia nyanyi pula, kita nak tergelak. Ayah awak suara lain. Menyanyi sayang, cuma mulai. Datuk L. Krishnan was one of the few Indian directors hired by the Shaw studio. He gave P. Ramli his first lead role in a drama called Bhakti, much to the shock of the studio people. I used Ramli as a hero in Bhakti because he was a singer. So I also told Ramli, don't give all the songs. Ramli's screen impact was so impressive that after Bhakti, Krishnan went on to cast Ramli as the lead in three other films. Their immediate success made P. Ramli a hot property. He was a good actor. He can't even dance. So I told him, don't worry, I'll keep only up to here. You just walk. You know, walk to rhythm. Following his first screen test, Ramli befriended comedian Dying Harris, who had helped him in his early years. Ramli soon fell for Harris' daughter, Junaina. But Harris wanted Ramli to marry his older daughter, Junaida, a divorcee. Ramli, who hated confrontations, took the path of least resistance. In early 1950, he married Junaida. His only biological son, Nasir, was born three years later. That same year, Ramli won Radio Malaya's Best Male Singer Award with his song Aziza, making him a sought-after actor and singer. Aziza, composed before he became an actor, soon topped the charts and stayed there for over four weeks. Ramli rode on the song's massive popularity with every woman wanting to be Aziza. But the constant attention from his legion of female fans took a toll on their marriage. The next year, Junaida decided she had had enough and left him, leaving Nasir in P. Ramli's care. Despite juggling a rapidly advancing career and looking after Nasir, P. Ramli always found time for other people as composer Kasim Masdur, a studio messenger boy at the time, remembers. Tiap-tiap pagi, saya mesti kejumpa P. Ramli. Ketika dia mandi, Febri Singer dia naik King Kong. Saya kena main tujuan gramophone yang pakai pakai spring, pakai kunci, ya. Yang banyak membimbing saya dalam muzik ni ialah Alayarham Tan Sri P. Ramli. Dialah yang mengajar saya bagaimana nak tulis lagu dan bagaimana nak membaca not. Lama kelamaan uh, dia suruh saya tulis lagu yang dicipta. Dia lantik saya sebagai uh, uh, penolong pengarah muzik dia. To composer Ahmad Nawab, P. Ramli's extraordinary gift for music more than made up for his lack of formal musical training. Ini saya tengok dia pandainya dia boleh baca not without playing instrument. He can sing. Sekiranya lagu saya dinyanyi oleh P. Ramli, I can say that I'm barulah saya percaya diri saya komposer. Not long after his divorce from Junaida, P. Ramli was back on the dating scene. Beauty queen Mariani Ismail, who was Miss Singapore 1951, caught his eye. Kami selalu dating ya. Bila tak suka aja dia akan jumpa saya. Bila dah jatuh cita, dia bilang, saya nak kahwin sama you, dia bilang. Tapi saya tak mau you berlakon. You nak nyanyi boleh. 
saya ajar yu nyanji. P. Ramli had found the new love of his life. But by forbidding Mariani to become an actress, Ramli had unwittingly set the stage for his own heartbreak. Mariani was being seriously courted by the Shaw Studios, and someone else had a very special place in her heart. After his divorce from first wife Junaida, P. Ramley was convinced he had found love again with ex-Singapore beauty queen Mariani. But he didn't want his future wife to be an actress. P. Ramley was unaware that Mariani was being hotly pursued by film studios, including Shaw Studio, for a film career. And while Ramley was important to Mariani, she was not prepared to hurt her sister, Saloma, who on her return from Australia had fallen hard for P. Ramley. Habis satu malam tu Ramli datang ambil saya pergi makan, ajak pergi makan. Ramli dia very romantic. Orangnya suka peluk. Hmm. Saya tengok Saloma tengok macam terlalu admire. Mariani could not bear to watch her sister's infatuation. So she decided to sacrifice her own relationship and find a way to steer P. Ramli into Saloma's arms. Adik aku tak boleh cari, suami aku boleh cari. Macam mana nak marahkan si P. Ramli ni kan? Teringat yang dia tak kasih berlakon. Kebetulan uh, jalan nampas, tengah sibuk kat saya. Saya kejap mata, sign kontrak lima tahun. Saya pergi rumah Ramli. Saya cakap Remy, saya panggil dia Remy. Dia panggil saya Mary. Saya cakap Remy, saya dah sign kontrak tau. Saya nak jadi bintang film. Terus mata dia sepet. Telinga dia merah. Oh, mau jadi bintang film ya, dia kata. Mariani was baffled at P. Ramley's lack of reaction. But she soon found out why. Dia pergi ke Mr. Quack. Itu baru punya bintang film Mariam. Dia sign contract semalam kan. You jangan kasih masuk dia saya punya set. Dan saya tak mau berlakon sama dia. You jangan suggest saya berlakon dengan dia. Terus Mr. Pek jumpa saya, Mariam, itu you punya nama sudah tukar ya, Mariani. Itu P. Ramli tak mau berlakon sama you. Dia tak kasih you, jangan pergi masuk set dia tau. Nanti dia terus tak mau syuting, dia mogok nanti. Baiklah, terus tak tegurlah selama tujuh tahun. Ramli's popularity as a charismatic actor and singer rose with each movie. Ramli gained a reputation as a bit of a ladies' man. In 1954, six years after he started working with Shaw as a stagehand, P. Ramli was performing before the Sultan and Queen of Perak, North Malaysia. Pleased with the show, the Sultan asked Norizan Muhammad Noor, one of his wives, to catch the show on the second night. Norizan confided in academic Professor Dr. Wan Hashim that the Sultan's orders came with a warning. Tapi dia beri amaran, Norizan, kamu jangan pandang matanya. Kerana mata piramid itu magnetik, katanya ada besi berani, takut jatuh cinta. Norizan pada waktu itu memang tidak begitu boleh minat dengan piramid, tapi oleh kerana seperti arahan suaminya, dia pergi menonton. When Ramli was introduced to Norizan, there was instant chemistry between them. Ormai Suri berkenalan, terus jatuh cinta kepada piramid. Norizan became one of P. Ramli's biggest fans. Although the distance between Singapore and Perak kept them physically apart, it did not stop them from communicating over the telephone. But P. Ramli kept his distance, respecting Norizan's status as the Sultan's consul. Dan suatu percintaan yang cukup sukar bersembunyi dan saya diberitahu oleh Norizan bagaimana tuanku mula tahu perhubungan mereka itu ialah kerana bil telefon itu tiba-tiba melonjak naik di luar kebiasaan di luar kebiasaan ini ada sesuatu their relationship continued to blossom however Ramli was apprehensive about the huge potential for conflict in getting involved with someone of Norizan's status but it never materialized tak ada gaduh-gaduh tak ada apa sebabnya apa yang Norizan bagi tahu sama saya memang Sultan pun sayang dengan Ramli P. Ramli and Norizan were married on February the 6th, 1955. 
and Ramli voluntarily stayed away from Perak until the Sultan's demise in 1962. News of Ramli's marriage to Nurizan came as a big blow to Mariani, his former love. She had broken up with him in order to matchmake him with her sister Saloma. Marriage to Norizan coincided with an exciting phase in P. Ramley's professional life. In 1956, P. Ramley played the title role in the historical film Hung Tour and wrote the music. He won the award for Best Musical Score at the Asia Pacific Film Festival. It was the first international award for Ramley and Shaw, and Ramley dedicated one of the film's most popular songs to his new wife, Norizan. <laughs> With Nurizan, P. Ramley's appearance and lifestyle underwent a complete change. She wanted the palace decorum she was used to observed in the family home. Nasir, his son with his previous wife, eight years old at the time, remembers life with Norizan and his new adopted and step siblings. Bapak I makan kami kena disappear. Tadi tadi dengar suara pun, tunggu Norizan panggil. Caci, dia panggil Caci. Caci, Norma, Betty, sesali turun. Baru kan lebih turun. Bilik empat empat bilik, dia tak ni ngumpul tukar. Bapak I sambil masuk salah bilik. But it was during his marriage to Norizan that P. Ramley, the entertainer, was at his most prolific. Some say she was the muse for many of his greatest works. In 1955, 26-year-old P. Ramley wrote and acted in his directorial debut, Penarik Becha, one of the most memorable films in the history of Malay cinema. It catapulted him into the ranks of more established directors. Featuring his enduring hit song Aziza, written ten years earlier, the film won five major awards, a result of P. Ramley's multifaceted skills on the set. Dia suka art, art of feeling. Macam, kenapa? Macam-macam gitu tau. Dia, dia punya art lah, dia macam ajar saya art. Macam, amran. Macam gitu tau. Dia suka ajar. Orang kalau tak tahu macam Hindustan, tapi art. With Malay audiences responsive to films directed by Indian talent, Ramli had to maintain some traces of Indian flavor in Penarik Becha. Kemudian ada sinsi yang seolah-olah macam beli Hindustan, rumah pocho, masuk air, nasi turun bawah, itu semua kebanyakan beli Hindustan. But P. Ramley was not averse to rocking the status quo. And in his follow-up directorial work, Samira Padi, Ramley made a film totally devoid of any trace of Indian influence. The film's success was a milestone for Malay films. Ini diakui sendiri oleh Shaw Brothers. Tidak ada satu film yang boleh merosakkan film Hindustan. P. Ramley seoranglah di bila yang, yang merosakkan koleksi film Hindustan. P. Ramley's third film, Pancha de Lima, was the only one he directed but did not act in. The script was written by one of the Shaw brothers. At the preview of the film, attended by Shaw Studios' mostly Indian directors, Run Run Shaw suddenly stopped the show. Run Run Shaw duduk depan, tahan, film tu stop. Buka lampu, semua preview room terang. Semua pengarah waktu tu ada, dipanggil oleh Run Run Shaw, termasuk P. Ramley. Jadi, Shaw Brothers marah. Shaw Brothers bilang, you are director. Satu budak muda boleh buat filem yang baik. Kau yang telah banyak pengarah, tak berani ambil filem tu. Shaw was furious with these more established directors' lack of confidence and reluctance to work on his script. 
But with Ramley's success, the Shaws provided more opportunities for new Malay directors to direct movies for the studio. The stinging rebuke from Shaw, however, had sowed the seeds of discontent amongst directors and actors. In 1957, P. Ramley walked away with a Best Actor Award at the Tokyo Fourth Asian Film Festival. This time for his unforgettable performance in the tearjerker Anaku Sazali, where he played dual roles of a loving father and a rebellious son. Actors, workers and studio staff turned out in full force at the airport to welcome P. Ramley home from the festival. But as P. Ramley's popularity soared to a new high, the silence of the press was deafening. P. Ramley sudah tak ada apa ni? news lagi tentang P. Ramley. Wartawan-wartawan sudah baikot kat dia. His new status as the Shaw's golden boy intensified the resentment of established actors and directors who had considerable influence on the press. But Ramley's career was just beginning and his critical and box office successes held out the promise of further cinematic brilliance. P. Ramley continued to enjoy spectacular success with each consecutive film he was involved in. Everything he touched seemed to turn to gold, but the stunning pace of his professional life left him very little time for his family. Norizan began to feel neglected. It was not the life she had envisaged when she gave up the palace for P. Ramley. But for P. Ramley, marriage to Norizan inspired such artistic brilliance that he was able to make 12 highly successful films. P. Ramley's success continued to be a thorn in the side of established directors, actors and journalists who would use every opportunity to discredit him. Sebenarnya komplot ni daripada zaman awal lagi. Uh, abang belum pergi ke studio Jalampar lagi. Sebelum tu, abang, bila abang pergi, abang dah dengar cerita yang ada satu puak uh, menentang P. Ramley kerana Shaw memberi layanan macam anak emas kepada P. Ramley kan. Sabe Bos kata, what he wants Give it to him. Jangan kata oh ini tak boleh itu tak boleh. Oh ini mahal lah itu mahal tak boleh. However, this special treatment was not extended to other actors or directors at Shaw Studio. Despite the backstabbing, Ramley once more stepped into new cinematic territory, writing and acting in his first comedic film, Bujang Lapok was a film about three bumbling but good-hearted bachelors who were always on the lookout for love. Aini Ja overheard Ramli telling friends about his new comedy. Jadi cara dia bercerita tu terasa macam dah tengok wayang. Karena P. Ramli bila bercerita dengan gerak mata, dengan gerak tangan, dengan nada suaranya, sampai ke shot-shot semua dia bercerita. Ramley knew he needed people who were naturally funny to co-star in his first comedy outing. So he picked and indulged comedians Aziz Sattar and S. Shamsuddin to provide rare gems of comic improvisation. Kau buat kau punya suka sendiri. Saya pun dah takut bila dia cakap itu. Maksudnya dia dah marah. Jadi dia tengok. Ah, cuba rasa lagi sekali. Ah, ha, cuba. Lepas sekali. Lep. Belum lagi dia. Belum lagi. Lagi. Jadi apa yang dia nak tu tadi. Hati yang terkucil tadi kau cakap tu. Itu tu boleh. Hey, Ramli. Ya. Siapa kau? The film, when it was released, was an astounding success. Singkong kepala hutan kau. Aku tengah ajar berada daerah kau orang bising. Ha? Dia mengarah seorang sabar. Dia boleh kontrol orang. Tak boleh gini tak boleh. Tapi saya dengan sudut dia tak boleh kontrol. Apa yang saya buat mesti diikutnya. Yang saya bangga satu, bila saya tengok bujang lapuk, tidak ada satu yang saya buat dia buang. Badi, apa ni? Tekalan dengan dia ni. P. Ramli went on to create two more hugely successful sequels to Bujang Lapok. Fresh from the exceptional success of the Bujang Lapok trilogy, Ramley wrote and directed a parody of Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, based on the trilogy's characters. 
Eson ngising, semar ngising, kape wong foto ngising. Alibaba! Certain lines from the show, some of them spontaneous improvisations, would go on to make cult status among Malaysian audiences. And although Ramli played the villain for the first time, the film still enjoyed outstanding box office success. New actress Sarima remembers Ramli teasing her on set. <coughs> Extra lalu pun dia ambil berat. Dia kalau berlakon, dia tidak mau dia satu orang bagus. Rupanya cantik, umurnya 18. But Ramli may have crossed the line with his improvisations. It was almost banned by the censor board for improper depiction of the Arabic language and had to be redubbed with minimal Arabic accent. P. Ramli went on to win five more major international awards from 1958 to 1964, during which he made some of his most popular comedies. But as he became increasingly engulfed by his art, his personal life began to suffer. Cracks began to appear in his marriage and fights with Narizan at home became more frequent. Hoping his problems would go away, P. Ramli quickly immersed himself in a new film that took a critical look at the prevailing social class systems in the country. Not for the first time, the film's theme song, composed and sung by P. Ramli, became a bigger hit than the film itself. And while the film was not a big box office draw, it received critical acclaim, validating Ramli as a maestro director. By now, everyone wanted to act in his films, no matter how small the part. Ready? Abang nak ambil kau dengan abang. Abang terus cium tangan diri. Terima kasih, abang. Dan saya tak tanya berapa harga bayaran. Pasal saya hendakkan arahan bawah dia. Ya. Aku datang hendak memisahkan. Bila dah keluar dekat panggung, barulah orang kenal saya siapa kesuai nata. Jadi, ialah guru saya yang nak kena nama saya. His unique directorial style often left a lasting impression on his cast and crew. Ramli direct liti. Pakai part to part. Perasaan orang dah betul. Perasaan lambat pun tak apa. Kalau dia boleh tunggu artis tu sampai satu hari, satu malam. Sampai dapat isu shot. While P. Ramley's career kept soaring, things at home were deteriorating. Norizan's discontentment with her own marriage made her sensitive to Ramley's working relationships, especially with his female co-stars. So when news reached home of Ramley and former love Mariani rehearsing songs together at the studio, Norizan flew into a rage. Nasir, who was eight at the time and living with P. Ramley and Norizan, remembered that day. Norizan ajak eh, Tersi jangan ikut Mami Pergi rumah Maria ni Cik Norizan bilang Kami duduk ada dengan kereta Norizan turun Mar Mar P. Ramli had no idea That the former and current love of his life Were about to confront each other For the first time Tahu-tahu ada orang badan besar Dekat pinggang Tanpa saya Saya cakar dia balik Lepas saya tahu dia Try passing Get up from my house Mariani reported the matter to the police. Eventually, Norizan apologized in court. Mariani accepted, and the matter was quickly forgotten. But not by Saloma, who had just returned from her stint in Australia. She went after Norizan. Dekat studio lah. Saloma sudah datang birang lah. Oh, dia cakap putih lah. 
you slept much later, uh, never mind. But one day, I think you are spent. Saloma, by then an accomplished and popular singer, started performing at stage shows with P. Ramley. And not long after, she was auditioning and acting in P. Ramley's movies. Norizan, desperate to save her marriage, was driven to check up on her husband with the young Nasir in tow. We spot Jack, ah, P. P. Ramli punya spy lagi terror. Bos, datang bos. Oh, P. Ramli marah apa? Saloma, you acting apa ini, Cik? Yeah, ni betul kan? You acting apa? Mereka tengok. By 1960, the cracks in their marriage had deepened. Nasir remembered things getting stormy at home. The marriage was in serious trouble. Rumours of Norizan's friendship with a younger actor and Ramli's dalliances with his co-stars pushed the relationship to its limit. And after six years together, P. Ramli and Norizan divorced. In one of her recorded interviews, Norizan, who left the palace for him, spoke of her frustrations with P. Ramli, whose art eclipsed everything else in his life, including her. She felt unloved. <laughs> P. Ramli himself never spoke of his troubled marriage to Norizan, who, unwilling to face her family, remained in Singapore after the divorce, before later moving to Kuala Lumpur. Tapi kita tak boleh begini saja, Ram. Kita mesti lekas kahwin. After an eight-year hiatus, Saloma was firmly back on the scene, this time making an impression on the twice-divorced, much-idolized and newly available P. Ramley. Nasir, who was nine years old then, recalls Saloma coming to take him out one day. He did not take a liking to her and told his father so. Nasir suka tante itu. I dia mau. Sampai saya pernah tulis seribu kali itu. I must love my auntie, I must love my auntie. Despite his son's resistance to Saloma, P. Ramli was set on marrying her. He confided in close friend Musalma, swearing her to secrecy. Dia tak pernah ada secret dengan saya. Tapi tentang Saloma, dia nak kahwin dengan Saloma ni, saya boleh terperanjat ni. But Ramli was insistent, asking Musalma to help him arrange a marriage ceremony. Boleh lah. Tapi ayat saya ingat dia main-main. Eh, saya bilang sama-sama tau, ni secret tau, saya nak kahwin dengan Saloma. Dan saya tu jam pun ingat, mesti dia tembirangkan saya juga, pasal dia suka berpulau. Dia bilang betul. Ramli and Saloma's marriage took everyone by surprise. In one of his interviews, Ramli said that he married Saloma not for her voice or beauty, but because they were soulmates. For Saloma, there was a fine line between being his soulmate and living with his eccentricities. Mula-mula dulu saya pelik, baru-baru kahwin tak tak reti lah. Dia ni betul-betul ganjil lah. Saya belum pernah jumpa orang macam apa macam dia. Dia kalau nak bikin lagu ni tak kira masa. Kadang-kadang dekat bilik mandi tu kan, mak cakap dekat dalam bilik mandi dia duduk berjam-jam, dia dah fikir, fikir, fikir. Sampai saya pun nak takut. Punya dia tarang lagu lah, buat skrip lah, nanti tangan dia macam tu, macam ni. Saloma embraced her married life with enthusiasm. As it turned out, she got on famously with Nasir. Masa dia orang gaduh. Dia orang bisa rumah gaduh. Dia orang dua gaduh. Yang kaya saya. Siapa dia orang gaduh, dia orang tak tegur. 
Rambi nak minta aku Benda air Cik cakap mama Mana diri punya ni 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 Idea macam Seringgit Habis jumpa mama Mama ada nasib lah mama Andi tak mama tu I kaya tau I love her so much lah Tu cakap I love her so much Saloma was involved in many of P. Ramley's successful films, but mostly in supporting roles. Where she had no acting role, they featured her exquisite voice. Singing was her first love, and that suited her husband well. Before long, they became the country's very own screen couple. <laughs> Lawyer, Inspired by his newfound happiness with Saloma, P. Ramli wrote, directed and acted in Ibu Mutuaku, one of his most highly acclaimed films. The film was not only a huge box office success, its theme songs surpassed the popularity of the film itself. <laughs> Mak boleh nangis dengar lagu tu. Oh nangis tu bang. Yes lah bang, lagunya menyayat hati. Mak cakap gini. Dia bilang, Syima, dia bilang, ini lagu, kau tengok dia bilang, kalau kita panjang umur, dia bilang gini, walaupun 30-40 tahun akan datang, dia bilang gini, orang masih kenang lagu-lagu ini. But it was during another of the film's songs, Jeritan Batinku, where Ramli played the saxophone that had audiences captivated across the country. Even though Ramli had mimed the part, he did it so well that to this day, many still believe that he was an accomplished saxophonist. First time he played Ibu Matuaku, he played saxophone. But many people say he played saxophone. Actually, he cannot play saxophone. He played saxophone yang main dalam apa ni ibu mertaku usuk B tapi because piramdi is a manusia yang luar biasa sebab dia pegang piano kan dia pegang violin kan exactly lah like him play saxophone the key semua betul the film won him an award for a specially created category at the Tokyo 10th Asian Film Festival in 1963 the most versatile talent it was one of the highest recognitions yet for Malay cinema, and with this win, P. Ramli's accomplishments as a filmmaker at the Shaw Studio were unparalleled. But on his return from the Tokyo Festival, the reception Ramli got at the airport was in stark contrast to his previous wins. His return this time was met only by three studio staff, Saloma and his personal assistant, Ramli Jr. He had come home to a highly charged situation between the studio and the union. The union's restriction of working hours had delayed the delivery of Ibu Mutuaku, forcing Ramli to pay for the crew's overtime claims from his own pocket. The meticulous director found it tough to meet Shaw's one picture every four months demand with limited shooting time and lack of script writers. <laughs> Dia nak sesuaikan background projector tu dengan orang tu kan uh, Manager tu semua Especially when they close up tu Itu pakai land yang paling bagus punya land tu uh, Dia import land tu Kan uh, Dia tu tu Dia jaga close up tu Dia beli land tu Dia suruh show beli land tu Kadang-kadang gambar dia bikin nak masuk festival 6 bulan Penalized for the union's actions, Ramli felt that his efforts and dedication were unappreciated. He began to get disenchanted with the studio. The lack of scriptwriters forced P. Ramli, like most directors, to adapt from other stories. But he gave the audience what they wanted with simple but clever plots. The Ramli is a very good man for Chedo, you know. One number one follow, very clever, and nobody can see it. Even Lagu also like that. But nobody will know him, what, what he has done. He's a wonderful chap, intelligent. Ramli created some of his best cinematic magic, and although he was far from content with the studio, the Shaws gladly continued to invest in him and gave him bigger budgets for bigger movies. 
kau boleh tahu siapa punya gambar yang maha <laughs> Saya susah cakap kau tahu Tapi Ramlil lah Especially dia beset Kadang-kadang dia beset Mereka-mereka dia kasi Dua hari sudah habis Dia bikin satu set Kadang-kadang tak ada Lapan hari, sepuluh hari Mereka bikin dia beset satu set Terrible at handling his own money Ramli asked Quek to deal with his finances And trusted him implicitly Kena saya masuk ke bank Nah, dia nak apa-apa, saya keluar kasih sama dia. Saya hey, ramai kau tak? Engkau kasih sama saya simpan di duit kau tak hitung. Apa Mr. Kui ni cakap macam budak-budak lah. Dia cakap sama kita itu macam. Dia kata Mr. Kui kalau mau pakai ambil. Dia kata. Duit dia banyak lah, makan tak habis. Itu je dia tak tak betul punya bini yang tak tahu apa. Saya tak tahu, tak mau tanya dia. According to Kui, they worked crazy hours to complete Ramli's films quickly because they were guaranteed hits. Kalau saya tahu ke, bukan main bagus saja dia main gambar. Duit masuk pun main main yang kau tak nak. Abi kalau dia nak apa sikit lebih kau kau tak boleh kasih. Tak boleh lah. Saya, saya kalau tak kasih sama dia, saya rasa huh. Continued success with his comedic films culminated in P Ramli winning his next and last international award for the film entitled Madu Tiga. In 1963, Shaw offered P. Ramley the chance to direct his first color film entitled Seniwati in Hong Kong. He was also to direct his fifth sequel of the renowned Bujang Lapo comedic series there. P. Ramley was ecstatic, but the excitement was short-lived. Without telling Ramli, the powerful union demanded higher payments and allowances for Ramli and his co-stars, forcing Shaw to cancel the production of both films. Ramli was bitterly disappointed. It was a time when Singapore was facing heightened left-wing radical trade union activities, and strikes at the Shaw studios were attracting the state's attention. Bila Perdana Menteri apa ni di Kuala Lumpur dapat tahu buat union ni, jadi dia tak suka Melayu-Melayu ni buat union so dia bilang dengan Shaw Brothers, you better close down so Shaw Brothers kata dia you better go to Madaka Villa Disillusioned P. Ramli moved to Merdeka Studio in 1964 after directing his last film Tiga Abdul he skipped the film's preview and saw it during its Kuala Lumpur run in the cinemas Shaw studio manager Kwek Chip Jian had his own theory as to why P. Ramli left the Shaw studio in Singapore. Kita biar orang tak, tak suruh dia pergi, dia tak pergi sebenarnya. Engkau tahu itu yang panggil sama dia siapa? Itu dia, itu Tauke panggil dia sana. Kasi punya orang tak. Nama dia Ho Ano. Dia cakap sama P. Ramli, apa kau tak? <laughs> what do you think of that? Madeka Studio was owned by Ho Ah Luk and businessman H M Shah, and managed by the Shaw family. P Ramley's absence was greatly felt at the Shaw Studios in Singapore. To his friends, P Ramley was like a bright star that shone on them. He helped to launch the careers of many. His departure left a deep void in their lives. Saya ini seolah-olah macam anak ayam kehilangan ibu. Paksa saya struggle sendirilah. Kalau tidak ada piramdi, tak adalah kasih masdu. Kalau dia sitting, saya cukup hormat dia director. He is a very good actor. Very good actor. Dia kalau ada dekat sini, semua happy lah. Dia nanti cakap macam-macam, dia menyanyi, macam gila. Shooting pun senang lah, dia orang semua suka lah. Bila dia tak ada senyum, senyap saja. <laughs> the Shaws, however, did not completely sever their ties with P. Ramley. They later acquired a significant stake in Madeka Studio. Dia begini, dia kat Kuala Lumpur ni, peralatan studio, barang ni tak cukup. Barang ni barang lama. Barang yang tak habis, yang Singapura dah tak boleh pakai, baru dibawa ke Kuala Lumpur. Macam kamera, Lighting apa kedua orangnya orang belum mahir macam di Singapura orang dah mahir semua dah puluh tahun kerja kat sini semua orang baru 
P. Ramley had thrived under the system at Shaw Studio. Backed by a highly experienced production team, he could concentrate wholly on the creative aspects of his work. But the state of things at Madeka Studio was very different. Tucked away beside a zoo with outdated equipment and inexperienced production staff, Ramley joked with friends that he was working in a zoo and was about to be eaten alive by a tiger. Ironically, Sitora Harimau Jadian, or Sitora the Were Tiger, became the title of his first movie at Merdeka Studio. He tried dabbling in special effects, but with a small budget and poor support services, he had to multitask, even doing his own editing. The film came out technically inferior. At the film's preview in Singapore, attended by actors Ahmad Daud and Sadia, the Shaw brothers walked out after only 15 minutes. So kita sendiri itu introduction jerk editing jerk kejap dia buat diri jadi Frankenstein. Ramley would never again replicate the spectacular success he achieved at the Shaw Studio. Dia orang janji macam-macam nak kasih dia buat color film, nak buat canggih-canggih lah sinemaskop. Tapi bila dia sampai sini, tak ditepatkan janji. Dia dah kecewa. Jadi dia punya uh, creation bila bikin film dah tak gairah macam di Jalan Ampas. The advent of television, Hollywood, Hong Kong and color Hindi films sounded the death knell of P. Ramley's attempt to reinvent himself. P. Ramley directed and acted in 18 more films for Madeka Studio until 1970, including the popular Do Re Mi trilogy. The comedic series was meant to recreate his popular Bujang Lapok characters but it failed to capture their innocence and lovable ineptitude. Laxmana Do Re Mi was the last film P. Ramley directed for Madeka Studio. At home, P. Ramley lived happily with Saloma and their five adopted children. His only biological son, Nasir, had married and left home at 19. Ramley realized that however dedicated he was to his work, he needed the emotional anchoring that only his family could provide. They meant the world to him. Dia sayang betul dengan anak-anak dia. Dia suka pijak baring, dia kena apa? Tiarap ke sini. Nanti anak-anak dia dipanggil lah pijak lah. Yang Sazali, yang picit lah, yang si Sabarudin tu kan pijak. Jajah, pijak. Dengan saya-saya sekali pijak dia. His son Sazali was his biggest fan. Oh tak ada macam ikut nyolat tuan buat biasa. Tengok anak dia sendiri pun tak ada ikut jejak deh. Daddy saya dia segak ensem. Saya tak ensem. Ramli liked to pamper his children, but he would be very strict when it came to music and schoolwork. Dia kalau ajar dengan anak-anak dia memang serius. Baik kira-kira pelajaran sekolah mahu pun musik. Dia tak boleh main-main. Dia boleh dah pukul saya, dia pujuk dia balik. Ya. P. Ramli tried to teach Nasir and Sazali to play the piano, but quick-tempered Ramli would get really annoyed when they played badly. He would thump them both, but according to Nasir, it was him who usually got it worse. Jadi masa saya lah. Bapak saya bergerak, saya kena. Tapi kalau orang wahal, saya kena. Despite Ramley's domestic upheavals, Ahmad Nawa, Ramley's longtime friend, was privy to the star's other eccentricities. Dia punya favorite tu, timikai. Timikai dengan kicap. And then they taro uh, chili cream. It's okay. And they chicha. Every time they're not done, they call the mat. I go to the home. I say, I say, prepare to lah. And then they make favorite uh, gunting rambut. Yang jadi mangsa je nasi lah. And the gunting, macam mana patient. At home, when Ramli felt like eating a particular cuisine, he would call up Mariani, his sister in law, who he was once in love with. Ramli ni dia uh, dia very loving, 
dia tak suka uh, selalu mak kerja teruk-teruk di rumah macam masak-masak sibuk-sibuk semua dia adakan orang gaji dia tak selalu mak sentiasa make up aja cantik duduk buat tatting buat laboci gitu aja uh, dia tak suka macam selalu mak kerja-kerja yang kena dengar saya lah nah bila nak masak lauk yang kesukaan dia saya perlu datang lah masakkan dia selalu mak duduk dan diam cantik aja. Ah, gitu. Itu dia punya perangai. Si Ramli punya perangai. Pampering Saloma was Ramli's way of showing his love for her and keeping his family together. This was important to Ramli, who felt that he had already lost one family, his friends at Shaw Studio in Singapore, whom he still missed dearly. In 1967, after three consecutive box office flops since Ramli's departure, Shaw Studio on Jalan Ampas ceased production for good. It was the era of the swinging 60s and the world invasion of rock, soul, pop, reggae and blues music. The Bee Gees, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles and the Supremes all became household names, displacing P. Ramley's brand of music and singing style. And while local pop singers struggled to compete with the new musical craze, P. Ramley remained true to his music. The consequences were disastrous. Piramli pernah kena bu di stage di Dewan Bahasa Pusaka. Waktu tu malam tiga Ramli, Piramli, E Ramli, E Ramli. Saya akan bermain. Jadi bila Piramli nak keluar menyanyi, semua orang bu. Saya tengok waktu pop di stadium penyanyi Singapura dengan Malaysia. Bila penyanyi Malaysia keluar mesti orang bu. Jadi orang tak suka waktu tu. But these incidents only served to strengthen Ramley's resolve to promote the preservation of traditional Malay music. Lagu-lagu macam lagu joget, orkes-orkes combo, lagu-lagu asli, gazal dan dendang sayang ini tidak pernah di dipertandingkan atau diperunjukkan. Kalau lagu-lagu ini tidak diberi galakkan. Maka Nusaya lagi 10-20 tahun akan datang, lagu ini akan dilupa terus dan muzik-muzik dari barat mereka akan mewakili muzik kita. Masa berjauhan apa nanti kenang bila dipahamkan itulah saya. By this time, P. Ramley's son Nasir was making his own way in the music industry. But Ramley was disappointed at what he saw as Nasir's lack of music and acting skills. It was a sensitive subject that often left them on non-speaking terms. Nasir lamented having to live up to public expectations of him as P. Ramley's son whenever he performed. I am beban satu je. Bila I ada show, orang panggil I nyanyi, orang mesti compare. Oh, tak macam bapak dia pun. What should I nyanyi style I? Bukan nak ikut Ramley. P. Ramley made it clear he had no interest in Nasir's brand of music. But Nasir caught him hiding behind a pillar at the Merlin Hotel to watch him play one night. As their love-hate relationship continued, P. Ramley felt his son slipping further away from him. Dia dengan Nasir ni kurang sikit, kurang rapat. Tidak duduk, cerita apa, tak ada. Dia yang rapat betul Zazali. Ha, termasuk bila datang si Zazaloma, dia rapat dengan Zazaloma. Bila datang Sabarudin, dia rapat dengan Sabarudin. Sebab-sebabnya saya tak tahu kamu kena nak mengikut cerita Kasma Buti. Junaidah ni tinggal nasib begitu aja. Dia tinggal begitu aja dengan Piramdi. Siapa Piramdi nak syuting? Tak ada orang nak jaga. Yang jaga ni lepas tu baru dia hantar kat Penang. Jadi tidak apa tak bersama. Sebenarnya nasib sama bapak dia pun ada clash. Clash pasal kahwin aja lah. Tapi ni kita tak boleh kita terangkan lah. 
Nasir was not the only relationship Ramli held dear that seemed to be slipping away. In 1968, Ramli's longtime recording company, EMI, decided not to renew his contract when it ended. It was a big shock to P. Ramli. I don't think, I don't think EMI want to do your recording because your lagu dah tak tak laku lagi dah. And then EMI voice pun orang tak terima. So waktu tu saya tengok muka dia merah dah. I feel so upset. Tengok, Piramli make so much money for EMI. Then he dia boleh cakap begitu. Piramli swore he would never again work with EMI under any circumstances. It was the ingratitude that stung him more than the rejection. Ramley concentrated on his films, doing everything he could to reach out to his audience. He introduced significant changes to his themes and portrayed multiracial settings in Sesuda Subo and Gerimis, but the audience was not moved. Then he tried a Hitchcock-style thriller in Dr. Rushdie and even a raunchy theme in Gelora, but the audience was too besotted with foreign movies to notice. Rejected for his singing, acting and directing, Ramli's humiliation was complete. With one fell swoop, his status had changed from idol to fallen star. Bila Syur Mingok tunjuk kepada Piramdi surat itu, uh, kontrak Piramdi tidak boleh disambung lagi. Sign oleh Ja'far Abdullah. Jafar Abdullah, a Shaw organization executive, also said in the letter that P. Ramli was a has-been and his movies were no longer selling. Ada satu kawan abang masuk kerja di Shaw Brother, dapat foto stack dan surat itu abang dapat baca. Memang surat itu betul macam nak membunuh P. Ramli. P. Ramli ni filem sentiasa laku. Yelah dia nak perkecilkan dia. Katalah macam-macam kan, ha. Show lah yang start ni. 1972 to 73 were Ramley's darkest days. With hardly any acting, directing, composing or singing jobs offered to him, he was desperate to find the means to support his family. P. Ramley sang at weddings with Saloma acted as compare for stage shows and became a judge for acting competitions to make ends meet. Nasir did not realize how broke his father was. Saya pun kadang-kadang jumpa dia. Jumpa dia. Dia tak pernah bilang yang dia susah apa. Dia act normal kan. Jadi saya tak tahu nak predict macam mana dia. Dia tak pernah cerita dia punya kesusahan. Macam mana susah dia pun dia. Dia, dia pendam ke. Yet Ramli's critics were relentless. There was very little sympathy for him. The Ramli skeptics among the journalists were almost gloating in their review of his fall from grace. P. Ramli memang kecewa dengan wartawan. <laughs> kecewa dengan wartawan. Dengan saya, saya, saya sendiri pun kadang-kadang saya nak jumpa dia pun susah. Dia malah nak jumpa wartawan. Kan? Tapi bila ada satu pengkat tu, dia ada dalam studio tu. Dia tengah mengubah lagu, mencipta lagu kan. Tapi bila saya masuk dengan wartawan tu, dia cakap dia lari. Dia tak nak jumpa. But P. Ramli was fortunate to have found a friend, fan and benefactor in businessman Dato H.M. Shah. They set up a Malaysian film enterprise called Perfima. Enterprise called Perfima. The plan was for P. Ramli to direct his long-awaited colour film. They brought in five more members into Perfima. The company brought new hope to P. Ramley. He had dreamed of setting up P. Ramley Film Productions, his own film company, to rival the Shaw Studio one day. But Ramley was in for another disappointment. Bila bangunan tu dah siap, hari pertama, P. Ramley dengan Cemcah diberhentikan, dikeluarkan daripada Perfima. The majority of Perfima decided that its first colour film project would not be directed by P. Ramley, but a younger director, Jin Shamsuddin, who had just completed a film course in London. Ramley felt totally dejected and defeated. Mana Perfima jadi? Kalau kita ada dalam tu, insyaAllah jadi. Pasal ada kita ada pengalaman, ada duit, macam tu orang tak ada apa-apa. Pengalaman saja. 
Pengalaman tak ada duit tak jadi. P. Ramley was at the lowest point in his career. Putting food on the table for his family was a daily struggle. He was forced to do whatever he could to earn a living. Pasal masa tu dia suruh buat kedai warung untuk main maju. So he is living on the pendapatan the maju punya, you know, table money. So makin lama makin turun. Ramli was embarrassed when his childhood friend Sukadi found him at the Mahjong store. He tried to hide his embarrassment by showing his annoyance with Sukadi. Dia marah dekat dia, tegur juga dekat dia. Jadi dia pun marah juga dekat saya lah pasal saya tak duduk sebelah dia. Dia kalau kita jumpa kena duduk dia, dakak dia, cerita dalam setengah jam, lari tak apa. Ni pasal saya nak pergi meeting dengan uniform pula, mana boleh duduk kedai macam. To help his boss, his long-time personal assistant Ramley Jr. approached a small recording company. Fu Chakwan tulis cek seribu bagi Ramley. Buat empat lagu. Ramley wrote the songs and Saloma's sister Mimi Loma recorded them as Saloma was still contracted to EMI. But P. Ramley was eager to produce his first color film and tried to obtain a bank loan to finance it. But he was rejected at every turn. Habis semua, ha, semua apa dia buat dia diminta bantuan semua tak dapat tau. Parah working paper dia very good tau. Bank tak percaya. Dia dengar pasal dia lah, piram ni terjam dah jatuh. Siapa nak percaya lagi? Siapa nak bagi duit kan buat? Dia dah no good already. Semua orang boleh tolong dia. Banyak orang boleh tolong dia. Kerajaan boleh tolong dia. Dia biasa menghadap ini orang, ini orang, semua kira macam tepis, tepis, tepis. And even the TV and radio stations had nothing to offer him. Waktu itu saya ke JRTM Orchestra itu jam 17 tahun. Saloma dapat program. Jadi dia teman Saloma ni pergi menyanyi tapi dia tunggu kat kantin. Uh, you see how, how sad Jiramli met life waktu tu. Tapi he's a singer. He's a tenor. Dia boleh dapat satu program. Piramli show ke apa. Nobody cares. P. Ramli may have had few friends left who cared. But in the bleakness of it all, he found a beacon of hope. P. Ramley struggled to put the pain of his disappointments behind him, but his friend and benefactor H. M. Shah continued to support him. They set up another company called Rumpun Malayu. Ramley, assisted by Ramley Jr., concentrated on the company's cinema renovation project and acquiring films for screening by Rumpun Malayu. They operated from an office at Shah Motel owned by H. M. Shah. But it was a visibly depressed P. Ramley who made what was to be his last trip to Singapore for the Asia Pacific Film Festival in 1973. As usual, he put on a happy face visiting old friends and sharing precious moments with them. His film, Laxmana Do Re Mi, was nominated for the festival. But the reception he got was a far cry from his golden years when he was the toast of the festival. Bila P. Ramley masuk, tak ada satu orang pun bangun mempelawa atau membawa P. Ramli duduk dekat Delegate Malaysia. Kemudian dia nampak saya. Dia terus duduk belakang saya kat Singapore Delegate. While P. Ramli was ignored by local film participants, those from overseas were queuing up to meet him. Yang daripada pelakon-pelakon luar negeri ni, tak ada jumpa pelakon-pelakon kita lah. Siapa saya tak jumpa. Tapi semua orang cari P. Ramli. Hong Kong nya lah, Indonesia bingung selamat pun cari peramli juga. Ramli savoured the moment, socialising with the delegates who had sought him out. For a while, he looked like the old Ramli who was friendly with everyone and loved to chat. When he called on old friends from the Shaw Studio days, they noticed he was depressed, wondering if people had forgotten or just disliked him. Saya tu jawab Ram, 
Jangan kata mereka Biar berjuta lagi manusia tak sayang sama lu pun tak apa Asal Allah sayang sama lu cukup dalam Dan terjawab abang You will be remembered forever 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 Ya dia kata Orang dah tak peduli saya Saya punya karya pun orang dah tak suka saya Saya dah tua lah Saya dah tua lah dia cakap Saya hendak filem Melayu ni akan apa Cantik lagi, maju lagi macam luar negeri Tapi saya tak sapat cita-cita saya tak sampai Saya kecewa dia cakap For actor Aziz Sata, to whom P. Ramley was a mentor and successful movie icon, Ramley's aura of dejection felt strange. But he was shocked to see Ramley's true financial situation in Kuala Lumpur. Hidup dia melarat. Kesian. Last saya pergi rumah dia, saya tengok. Dia makan hasil dengan telur. Nama dia besar. Orang tahu Piram dia siapa Tapi hidup dia melaratlah But Ramli was not one to wallow in self-pity Especially in the company of friends He didn't bear grudges Tapi Ramli ni saya tahu dia Nombor satu dia tak pernah condemn Ini pelakon-pelakon lain Ini tak pernah cerita pelakon-pelakon lain Ini hati semua tak ada Dia dia suka happy ya. And then he like to Cerita yang lucu-lucu uh, tak Ramli's friends say they could sit all night having coffee with him at the food stalls, enjoying his self-deprecating humor and stories about his life. But they all agree on P. Ramli's one exasperating trait. He couldn't say no to anyone asking for help. It became his own undoing. Kalau dia ada duit, katakan duit tu ada 200 kat dalam kocik. Satu hari orang datang, orang kata, Bang, saya susah ni nak balik kampung. Mak saya sakit, tak ada duit. Iyakah? Semua dia kasih. 200 tu dia kasih. Selalu orang tercegak. Selalu orang cakap, saya ada hari tu. Selalu orang cakap, eh, Daddy, kenapa Daddy kasih semua? Kan kita, ini hari-hari minggu. Mana ada bank? Dulu mana ada ATM kan? Tak apa. Itu rezeki dia. Saya tak apa. Allah ya Rahim ni, dia tak boleh tengok orang susah. Orang putak beli dengan dia. Terma, siapa tak boleh pukul dia. He was also generous in his professional life. Even when he was already a big name, he willingly shared top billing with his co-stars, often reviving other people's flagging careers. It was actress Sarima who was discovered and nurtured by Ramli ten years earlier that still believed in his talents and asked him to direct her new film. Sehari sebelum dia meninggal tu, saya, arwah suami saya, kita ada dekat Shah Motel. Dan memang nak tahu ada, saya dah lupa apa, apa tajuknya cerita tu, dan memang dia setuju. The offer from Sarima and her husband filled P. Ramli with a new optimism. But P. Ramli was never again to set foot on a film set. Before dawn on the 29th of May 1973, P. Ramli had a heart attack at home. Saloma accompanied him in the ambulance to the Kuala Lumpur hospital. Their son, Sazali, waited at home with the younger children. A few hours later, Sazali received the dreaded call from Saloma. He refused to believe her at first. Betul, Mama dah suruh doktor dah tiga kali pam dah, dia punya dada dah. Doktor cakap meninggal. Tapi kita pun dapat tahu Orang gaji dengan adik-adik saya, menangis lah. Cezali, who was 15 then, recalls his father's last words to him just before the heart attack. Jaga mama baik-baik. Dia kata, jaga adik-adik lelok. Jangan tinggal mama, apa sekalipun terjadi. Kalau kecuali mama dah tak ada lagi, kau nak pergi, pergilah. Tapi pergi dengan cara baik. P. Ramli. A great man and a true genius had died far before his time. He was the original hero of the Malay film world. His brilliance and kindness an inspiration to many. The news of P. Ramley's death at the age of 44 was met with disbelief. Saya lemah bila dengar dia meninggal. Lemah tenaga dia. Air mata ni bercucu. 
Belakang saya cakap dengan Saloma lah Kita nak turun Kita nak tengok mayat dia Saloma tak kasih tengok Dia bilang Piramli pesan dia tak nak tengok siapa pun dia mati ha, Itu kita kecil hati sikit lah dengan Saloma Saya dengar kat radio Piramli meninggal kan Saya terus pergi rumah dia Nanti jam belum ada lagi orang ramai Saya tengok dia Tapi mayat dia saya tengok betul-betul dia senyum tu When his first son Nasir heard the news, he wasn't sure how to react. He couldn't believe it at first. Tapi bila saya tengok mayat di atas imen itu baru air. Datang doktor mula tolak mata, dia tolak hidung yang mana doktor air marah dia orang. Tak apa nak, nak bedah pun tak bagi bedah. No, no, leave him one piece dia kata. Nasir said Saloma was in a daze throughout the funeral. She acted as if everything was normal. Dia lawan juga Tapi dia betul Dia betul letih dalam dia Dia cinta sejati Sebelum dia meninggal Dia cakap dengan saya Ya Aku nak mati lah Tak nak hidup lagi Apa kau cakap ni cakap, Buat apa aku nak hidup Daddy dah tak ada Dia kata Kau tolonglah Bila aku dah mati nanti Kau kuburkan aku Kat sebelah dia Saloma was quoted in the newspapers as saying after P. Ramley's death, even if I were to die and somehow live again, I would never find a husband as good as P. Ramley. When Saloma died almost ten years after P. Ramley, Mariani kept her promise to her sister. She made sure they were together, side by side, in their final resting place. Tiba-tiba dia bersuara kat saya, Haji, kalau gua mati, gua akan hidup seribu tahun lagi, Haji. The sudden death of P. Ramley, the greatest star of the Malay entertainment world at the age of 44, came as a complete shock to Malaysians. For close friends, his death had only just begun to sink in. They started to recall how oddly he had behaved before he died. Jadi saya lagi ni datang jumpa saya. Asa, dia mati rumah. Dia bagi tu rumah sial tu. Nak balik makan nasi tak ada. Nasi yang sebenarnya selama saya duduk rumah pilan ni tak pernah tak ada. Pada itu hari tak ada nasi. Dia selalu baik dengan saya bila saya datang. Hari tu saya datang nak jenguk Saloma. Dia rampas Melissa umur 6 bulan, dia bawa pergi belakang, dia tak nak cakap dengan saya. Malam tu dia meninggal. Ramli's son, Nasir, believed he had a premonition of his father's death. I dah habis kerja, I balik rumah. Dalam pukul empat lebih, I macam orang tumbuk perut air ni, I cakap, kerana Allah tak boh, orang macam orang tumbuk perut air tau. I terus bangun tau. Alamak, apa pasal ni? Macam waktu tu, I tidur balik. Pagi tu, polis datang ketuk pintu. Ramli's close friends attributed his heart attack to the anxiety of a recent court summons. Yang dia meninggal ni pun pasal dia terkejut Dia jamin satu hamba Allah Jadi besok macam tu ada kes lah Waktu dia belum meninggal 3-4 hari saya jumpa dia lah Dia, dia kena pikot kan Ada dia kena saman kan Janggut macam ada Dia susah hati Piramli ni yang saya tahu dia takut doktor Dia tak pernah pergi doktor Yang satu dia takut orang saman dia on the day of the funeral, Ramli Jr., his long-time personal assistant, was worried. Sebab itu, waktu dia meninggal, saya susah hati. Saya cakap Salomah Kak, macam mana ni Kak, nak ke bumi Kak. Saya takut tak ada orang. Saya takut tak ada orang. Pasal waktu itu memang tak ada kawan. Tak adalah siapa datang rumah dia tanya. Memang dia susah betul. Hari itu memang tak ada. Hari dia meninggal memang tak ada duit. Termasuk Salomah pun tak ada. Tak, tak ada duit. HM Shah. Bantu semua HM Shah. HM Shah bagi RM3,000 pada Saloma. Ramli Jr. couldn't have been more wrong. Hundreds of people thronged the house, mosque and burial grounds to pay their last respects to P. Ramli.
On the 29th of May, 1973, in the burial grounds in Kuala Lumpur, the world said goodbye to P. Ramley for the last time. Today, the memory of P. Ramley is fiercely and loyally protected by a nation that can't quite forgive itself for the way he was treated and will not tolerate any criticism of him. When it came out that neither Ramley nor any Malaysian owned the rights to his films, many were emotionally crushed. His films could not be screened locally without permission from the owners, the Shaw organization. While others continued to profit from his films, P. Ramley's family was completely left out. <laughs> Ini semua kita punya property. <laughs> All ours. Concerned organizations in the Malaysian entertainment industry helped his family gain copyrights to some of his songs. This is the only legacy of P. Ramley that belongs to them. According to Nasir, his father had planned to use the royalties from his songs to perform the Hajj to Makkah. Did I plan? But by the time the royalties came through, Ramley had passed away. To P. Ramley's legion of loyal fans, brand P. Ramley is very much alive beyond the realm of copyright. Ramley composed over 390 songs in his lifetime. His music recognized all around the world. In more recent years, younger generations of Malaysian singers have re-recorded P. Ramley's songs with varying success. Saya sendiri pun bila sampaikan lagu oleh Tansi Allah Yaham Tansi Piramdi ini rasanya sampai menusuk ke dalam jiwa lah kalau kita menyanyi. To his loyal fans, however, Ramley breathed a certain life into his songs, stirring the heart of anyone listening to them. Sebenarnya kan, lagu-lagu itu tak boleh dimodernkan. Sebab lagu itu dah, itulah asal dia, dia punya, dia punya itulah karakter Hafi Ramli. Katalah Mona Liza Hamid Penting, dia cuba nak buat tambah colour. That's a work of the people you must respect. P. Ramley had no formal education in music, yet he rose to become one of the greatest musicians in the country. He wanted music to be taught from an early stage in Malaysian schools, so the passion and love for traditional music would be inspired from young and never forgotten. Kalau kita tidak semaikan music-music, Tradisional asli ini ke dalam dada anak-anak kita, anak muda kita. Usaha di satu hari, musik lain akan mengambil tempat. Kerana di dalam dada mereka itu kosong, tidak ada apa-apa. Semua juga macam kita mengajar anak kita pergi belajar agama. Walau bagaimanapun, dia pergi berapa tinggi pun, dia jarang tidak menukar agama. Kerana agama yang telah diajar oleh bapaknya telah tersimpan dalam dada dia. Itu juga musik. Supaya musik lain tak boleh memperoleh jiwanya. Cinematically, Ramley is most fondly remembered for his portrayal of the innocent, downtrodden hero or the charming, mischievous playboy, his own wicked sense of humor often permeating his films. 
His last film, Laxmana Do Re Mi, was a spoof of his own losing battle for viewership. It was probably the lowest budget film he ever made, but he and his co-stars had the time of their lives doing the spoof. Zam Zam Alakazam! Ramli's influence on Malay popular culture today remains unstoppable. Even in death, his magic finds its way into the hearts of successive generations of Malaysians. Banyak yang kita boleh pelajari ya daripada karya-karya beliau dan kenapa dia masih boleh ada entertainment value yang sangat tinggi segi-segi dialog dia yang tidak pernah waste tak pernah wasted dia kita pasti dengar ingat segar dengan kita without piramli malaysia would be very different i think he set very high standards for all of us can your song be as good as a piramli song can your movie be as good as a piramli movie Decades later, there is still no substitute for Malaysia's charismatic genius. Semua dia bikin sendiri. Bikin skrip, mengarah, berlakon, kita lagu, editing. Saya tak fikir kita dapat lagi satu piramli lah. Memang tak ada orang tolak banding, tak ada orang boleh ganti tempat dia. Tak ada orang boleh ganti tempat dia.